Welcome to Inside New York's Art World. We're at the Pace Gallery tonight, and I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and especially pleased to introduce our two guests tonight. One of them is often referred to as the doyen of American sculptors. Most of you know her as the creator of mysterious black or white boxes that are readily identified. This must be an Evelson. Well, this is a Nevelson, and a remarkable one at that. We're especially pleased to have you with us. Our other guest is Arnold Glimsher, president of the Pace Gallery. Arnold Glimsher has been in New York for 13 years, and during the course of that time, he has established himself as one of the most creative and dynamic dealers anywhere. Thank you for having us here. Louise Nevelson is one of the busiest artists in the world. In fact, as Arnold described, her work pours forth with uninterrupted regularity. She is now engaged in one of the most complex assignments I assume that any sculptor has had in the modern era. It is the design of sculpture, architectural ornament, and even more than that. This very morning, a press conference was held in New York City describing that commission. Can you tell us about it? The church that is built within this new building is on 54th Street and 55th Street. 53rd and 54th. In Lexington. And yes. Yeah. What Louise is referring to is St. Peter's Church that will be part of the new Citibank okay. skyscraper, yeah. which is a mixed-use development. The corner of that building is St. Peter's Church, and the purpose of today's press conference is to announce what Louise's contribution to that church will be. Yes. Well, the thing that really pleased me was that I don't think anywhere on earth have they taken the scale of this business building, office building, and encompassed the new building in the corner, a new church, that is built like a pyramid. And what the architects have done, which I think is remarkable, is there's a lot of air, and also there's a the other enormous building doesn't press down on it, but they've allowed a whole new area. And sure. so I was very, very pleased with that because that is where I will do the chapel and also do the uh, vestments. And I think, can we say that we're going to do the doors? No, the bronze doors. The bronze doors. And so that this pleases me that uh, I feel that I'm going to really do the whole thing. And I don't know, I was told by critics that came that outside of Matisse Chapel, that this is the first uh, uh, time, particularly, of course, in America, but also that um, I think that this is the first time that anything like this has been done. Simultaneously, um, Mrs. Nevelson is completing a 55-foot sculpture for San Francisco that will be installed in January, a metal piece for the waterfront. Uh, a, maquettes are underway for a bridge in um, Grand Rapids, Michigan. <laughs> Models were just finished for the new Senate office building in Washington, a 100-foot steel sculpture, black steel sculpture. There are about two dozen proposals that she's seeing whether or not she likes at this moment. We're, we're now thinking about commissions for 1980. I have often heard astonished replies from people who uh, were aware of the voluminous output that you have. How many people do you have working with you? First, let's go back a little and then we'll come up to this. Um, nature was kind enough to endow me with a great deal of energy. I mean, so much so it wore me out. There's <laughs> <laughs> the hovercraft again, spectators yeah. participating. Don't, be don't believe that. <laughs> and so in the beginning, uh, way back in the Second World War, I think, when you couldn't get materials. And I, did, I thought creation, I still think so in any form, is more important than the materials. So when you couldn't get these wonderful materials, 
I began to see in everything I observed creativity and that's how I began to pick up things on the street or wherever it was. We can all attest to that. Yes. <laughs> now I'd pick it up, sometimes I'd get up three, four in the morning to be able before it would disappear and bring it home. And I, being strong, I was able to carry beds, you know, for the top, the bottom, or Crates. chairs or crates or whatever. And then a little later, I, uh, well that went on for many, many years, almost two now, but now people recognize me doesn't quite seem right. <laughs> it's out of place. But nevertheless, so I would take these into the studio, clean them, prepare them, paint them, and put them together. Because I couldn't afford, at that time, help. And so and then I didn't know a wedgie. I knew the form when I saw it, but I didn't know it was called a wedgie. So someone said, that's a wedgie. <laughs> so then I knew it was a wedgie. <laughs> but I was visual, you see, and I would select these things through the eye. Then years later, I got some help, not many, someone, say, that would after 20 years or so. You mean an assistant in the studio? Not assistant. Someone that would paint the wood, mm. which I did for 20 odd years. So I don't call that an assistant. I call that someone that helps to paint the wood. <laughs> now, now, I <laughs> Listen, you don't have a right to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, nevertheless, um, the things that I have really gone through to bring <coughs> things to fruition is, is pretty remarkable as I see it in retrospect. Because I just had a birthday, I can speak more openly. I mean it. We're serious now. Now the point is that when I reached a certain point, as I said, I got someone to paint things. Then I got someone later to arrange and clean the studio and do these things. And really, dear, I have never had what you call an assistant. I have given the title assistant to Diana, but not because of her work. But she's been with me for so many years and done so many things. She's a Yale graduate, a brilliant girl. I couldn't say, well, she's washing dishes. <laughs> you know. So I gave her the title, and I think she deserves it. But that's it. And so, of course, another thing that has happened through technology, through the wonderful things that have happened, and I parallel, which I said in the beginning, my life with the times, is I go to Lipping Courts and they have taken I don't know how many pictures of me working the boundaries, the boundary up to. in North Haven, uh, Connecticut. And I work with the men and they have worked with me for years and I must say that they're marvelous, marvelous. But they also have all the equipment to do things. Now for instance, say a piece like this, I'll say, First place, they're wonderful. You're, they're supposed to just work and do these things, but there's more to them than that. And especially if they worked with you, they sense what you want. Now, if I say, Bobby, I want a half circle. They have a machine, and in no time, there's a straight piece put in that machine, and say in a few minutes or a little longer, you get your half circle. Then maybe, because I create spontaneously while I am there, not on a blueprint and not on paper and nothing. And that Do you I ever have models since there is an architectural? A maquette mm -hmm. sometimes, yeah, a maquette. But mm -hmm. your work is characterized by, you know, it's precision on the one hand, but its development is so spontaneous. How do you? Yeah, well, uh, for me, it's natural. 
It really is natural. And I'm going to finish about this. Now, for example, here's a piece that's a half circle. That same thing. Then, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, suppose I didn't quite want this and I wanted to shave it off. They shave it as if it was paper. You see, that's the miracle of this. And I, I correct another thing. Uh, the wooden pieces, I don't call them all boxes, dear. They're, you know, because they're not all boxes. But I do them in the studio, and when I, then they are put together. But when you see a, uh, you know, a big wall as big as that, that's not one piece, because it would be impossible to bring it in and out. So they are in sections, and then they are placed, you see? And well, anyway, I think that's one of the things that people, you know, don't understand. Because if you see a twenty-foot wall by Nevelson, yeah, yeah. they think she can't possibly have made it. Yes, but it's but made up of a hundred boxes, each this big. And sometimes, so she can handle columns. each of those boxes and columns quite yeah. easily and place them in place. What is the origin of the term environmental art? Many critics see you as the originator and the chief exponent mm -hmm. of environmental art. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. When did you start working with that, in that uh, yes. reference? Well, yes, uh, I don't quite remember the year, but I'll tell you the experience, and then that'll cover it. I was doing a show for the Grand Central Moderns, and they had some space like this, and windows and doors, and the desk and chairs and all, and I just conceived that all of this was unnecessary to a work of art. So we threw out everything, and since they had two doors, uh, windows that were parallel, I put a sculpture in one window, so that when I was putting the show on, every piece had to be related to the second piece. That meant there was in the end, we, I came to the conclusion that we had one piece. In other words, in my, or in not only mine, I hope it's in every artist, that there, the ultimate must be harmony. And if the artist is very well integrated, really integrated, know what they want, know what they're doing, you can put a thousand pieces together and it only means you've got one piece of sculpture if you choose, right? And so when I recognized this, I threw, fortunately in my life, the gallery people, the museum people have always been very nice to me. And if I had asked for things to be moved out or didn't want to, they really worked with me. So from there on, I began to put on my own shows and also, from the very beginning, I had a title for a show. In other words, there was a unity about having a title for a complete show. It, it wasn't pieces, you see. Then when you put them together, that made it one. So the whole thing became an environment. Well, well, you've said that you've always known that you were going to be an artist from the time yeah, you were three yeah. and a half years old. Is that well, right? as long as I can remember, <coughs> yes. Um, I think, and this is my feeling, now no one can say, is there a God? No one has seen him. Is there a this? We take things on faith a great deal, or we don't take it on faith, but we have a choice. Now, I have a feeling that when someone is willing to live and die for something, that means it's in the genes. I mean, because I don't think in one lifetime one could make an artist. Crusoe, a great singer, he couldn't make a voice, he could improve on the voice. But you're born with certain, some people have black eyes, brown eyes, some have blue. I mean, we're born with the equipment and if we recognize the equipment, we can fulfill that particular life. You see, now, uh, well, you can take anyone in public, uh, say Gabo, or take Elizabeth Taylor. Now, if anyone tries to be them, it's ridiculous. And they play those roles, and they're right for them. 
and if anyone else tries it, the shoe doesn't fit. So I believe that artists who are willing to dedicate them, well, it isn't even a dedication, it's more of a celebration, actually, to, to live that way. I don't, uh, I must tell you this, uh, years ago in New York, uh, someone said to me, you want to be an artist, what are you going to do when you find, maybe you're a fourth grade artist? Well, <laughs> I've said two things. I, I thought if you're a fourth grade artist, who's to judge? As far as I was concerned, I was an artist and I wanted to live my life that way. And I had the courage not to permit, or I didn't give anyone the right to superimpose on what I felt. I claim my life. I still do. <laughs> no one is living for me. No one is suffering for me. No one is supporting me. And I think the first thing you should do is stand up on your two feet and look in the mirror and like yourself and say, sure, this is my life and I'm going to live it. <laughs>
there's no artist that's involved in um, conceptual art that I'm involved with or in kind of storytelling art or narrative art but there are the art that I'm involved with is art that is something to further the perceptual processes themselves the word is that there is no dominant school of art at this time there are those who seem to be concerned about it and there are others who see it as a time of greater ferment than ever before how do you view it? are you asking me or Louise? both of them well, do you want to take it or should I take it? Okay. <laughs> <coughs> I think there is no dominant school. I think that it's, uh, by comparison to the art that's been produced from the turn of the century to the present, there's a famine. The movements of the 60s, where every two years there was another movement, there was pop art and op art and minimal art and coming, all coming after abstract expressionist art. <coughs> and it was a time at which I think one, one can understand if I put it in this perspective. The holistic image was broken w with the Impressionists. That is to say, the, the total image became subordinated to the parts. When you begin to take apart an image, it comes apart much more quickly than it builds together. So the centuries of production, of building this holistic, total, perspective, realistic image was shattered at the turn of the century. And what we've been involved in, in, uh, in all the disciplines, is analysis and reductionism. Um, the analytical viewpoint is, by definition, the analysis of the whole. So we have a series of artists who have each taken their aspect, their part, uh, of the perceptual process and worked on it. I mean, Albers is interested in the interchange of colors. It's a very tiny facet. He did it exquisitely well. Uh, various artists have been involved with various things. So when you get to a point where all of the subsystems, as we know them, have been explored, what do you do? You don't have a next movement. I do feel there has been, say when Warhol came on the market, and I'm going to compare him to something else which has nothing to do with it. When Warhol came on the market, he almost brought us a new point of view for the moment. No brushes, no oil, oil paints. They seem like things like a has been gone forever. Then it, it compares to that little girl Twiggy <coughs> that came on and every other model looked heavy and gross. For that moment, she seemed right. You see, that, is, that was the moment in time, the parallel. But somehow, uh, the god, uh, what's his name, Wafa, uh, he somehow twisted into another thing. And who saw that moment, well, it got emaciated, so that's one thing. Now, it is true that there there isn't just one road. We take one road because that's the, what we want, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the ultimate. It is true that all of it, the body of creative people, will eventually make one road. Because look what is happening in the art world. One does a reflection here or a note here or like uh, Crispo did that 21 mile thing in uh, California, or earth things, or now garden things they are making into. And whether you go with it or not, you have to admit that we are living, in spite of everything, in a very fertile time. And for you, in a very fertile town. Mm -hmm. Time. But I'm saying for you, in a fertile town as well, you've often commented how much New York has affected your perception. Right. In your recent right. memoir, Dawn's Plus Dusk's yeah. Conversations with Diana McCowan, mm -hmm. you make an especially poetic reference to New York City. That's what about right. this town makes you sing? Well, this, for me, this city and I were born in the right time. <laughs> uh, it, uh, I don't quite give a damn about the dirt and things. Now, I live near the Bowery, 
down near Chinatown Little Little. I was looking out the window this morning and toward the Bowery, and the buildings are so dilapidated you have no idea. And in these tenement houses, now this is this morning, uh, these tenement houses, then there was, looked like a storm was coming, this, well, about six o'clock. And then uh, s there was a light. It made El Greco, uh, wonderful Toledo, look like a tame picture by comparison. And in all of the tenements, there was one electric light, and it was in the furthest uh, window. It wasn't in the middle, it was the furthest toward the sky. And I looked, and I thought, well, really, I don't know of any picture I'd compare to it. So I think I live in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's marvelous. And uh, now, you see, now I have relatives that come to New York, and they come visit me, and they say, why do you want to live in the slums, the streets of dirty, there's paper there, and everything? But they never would sit down a minute and take a look. About 40 years ago, I went to Europe, and I went to Versailles, and saw all the wonderful things. And then 40 years later, I went to Europe, and went to Versailles 40 years later, and it seemed to me that the Versailles shrunk. <laughs> and I shrunk. Now that, in a way, is a symbol of life. We start, you know, and then somehow, every day, that's why I don't lie about my age or anything, I'm so jealous of my age, because of what, when I say something like that, I've got that whole uh, magnificent background of living life <coughs> almost every day. Sometimes you weep a little every day, sometimes you laugh a little every day, but you live life and with awareness. I want to give a very special thanks to Arnold Lincher, who has been indeed mm -hmm. kind to let us come here tonight, and to Louise uh, Neverson, an amazing artist with a vision and energy all of her own. Thank you again to Arnold. I mean, obviously you are a master builder in your own right too. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. I'm Barbara Lee Dunn.